many of them in England. But on the Tiggy stand, I met a man who reckons he's going to change all that. Plough manufacturer Roger Dowdswood. I think as we start incorporating more straw into the, the soil, packing is going to become more important because the soils are going to get fluffier and lighter. And I think it's going to be more important to, to settle these uh, soils down with the higher straw content to get a good germination. Why have you decided to import this particular thoroughbred, this firm? Well, we looked round and we found that the, the Tigger is, is the oldest manufacturer of fur presses in Germany and also is market leader. And we were lucky enough to do a deal with them where we can import their expertise and knowledge. Will they be painted Downsville green or will they come in blue like this? Well, I think it'll be a compromise. We should have a, a green frame with the, the brown rolls. Now, we've got two different fire presses on this stand. This great big one over here, what's this for? Basically, the big heavyweight 900 mil diameter one is for light land. Yeah. If you get a deeper penetration, yeah. it packs the bottom of the furrows better. Yeah. And then the, the little packer behind settles the surface, gets a good seed bed and, rejoice, and reduces moisture evaporation and has an effect of stabilizing the single roll so it doesn't fall over when the, the, the plough detaches. Now, what about this one here? This is smaller diameter. Yes. This we find is better on the heavier land, where you're not so uh, worried about packing the bottom of the furrows, but want to chop the surface about and settle it. And it's a big advantage for, to firm the furrows, ready for subsequent cultivations. How much extra power does something like this need? If you're pulling, say, five furrows, and you, you slap this on behind the plough, how much more power are you going to need? Very little extra. I was surprised. On the heavier land, of course, they don't sink in. So uh, it's less than a gear difference. You often play in the same gear. On very soft land with that one, obviously, it's doing a lot more work and takes a bit more pulling. So are you suggesting then that the chap who has a plough and he puts a, a furrow press on behind, he won't have to drop a furrow off his plough or buy a bigger tractor? No, normally now, most farmers have got bigger tractors and got a bit of power to spare. And I think uh, the addition of a, a packer and furrow press would be well worthwhile. The cost of these will work out at about £300 a furrow for the heavy land model and about £500 a furrow for the light land one. Furrow presses are available now, but for some new combine developments, we'll have to wait a bit longer. Class combines are, of course, a familiar sight on arable farms across England, but there are two features of this combine that are anything but familiar. The first one is a 22 and a half foot cut header, which has been available to German farmers for the past two years, but has yet to be brought into England. Class are a bit nervous about how it would cope with our conditions, with slightly wetter crops and heavier crops too, but they are evaluating it this year, and if it all works out, it should be available in England for harvest 85. The other feature, which is new to me, are these enormous flotation tires, which are used to cut down compaction. And there is a lot of compaction, because when this combine is completely full, it weighs over 16 and a half tons. The tires do present a problem, though. The overall width of 14 and a half feet exceeds the legal maximum allowed on the roads, both here and in Germany. But I expect that most farmers will get round that. But it wasn't just the machinery salesmen who were courting farmers at the show. Next week is the election for the European Parliament. And unlike in England, where the farmers' vote hardly matters at all, in Germany they're an important group, which all the parties try to win over. Traditionally, like their English counterparts, farmers here vote Conservative, which means the ruling Christian Democrat, or CDU. But they've been saddled with blame for the milk quotas, and the other parties, particularly the socialist SPD, are making the most of it. So will farmers really break the habit of a lifetime and vote socialist? A question I put to one of their candidates, Rudy Arndt. Yes, there's a great changing, uh, especially in the regions of Germany, where there are uh, 
small and medium-sized farmers like in this region in Hesse or in the southern parts of Germany, they are changing their minds. They say, no, we can't vote for the Christians because that's a, a wrong policy. They destroyed the small and medium-sized farmers and the profit has the, great, the big farmers. And so there is a changing. But aren't you playing politics? Because you've already said that Brussels must cut its expenditure. What will you tell a small farmer in Bavaria who is producing too much milk? I say him from this, from this uh, great expenditure for agriculture policy. The farmers get only 40%. And we give 60% of all the money for storage and for the destruction of the increasing agriculture surplus. And, it's, and, and I say give them all the money, but not for surplus uh, production. So are you saying that big farmers should produce less, but small farmers should produce the same amount? No. I, I say the big farmers can produce as much as they want, but don't give them any money. They can produce and put their products to the market, but without money from the taxpayer. Uh, so the socialist policy in Germany is to subsidize small farmers but not big farmers? So it, that's it. Huh? To subsidize the small farmers and the medium-sized farmers, the families in, 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 in the farmlands because we need them there, but not the big farmers. They can produce, they uh, can all uh, produce they want, they can produce uh, milk as much as they want, but without any subsidy. There's no doubt that the plight of the small farmer is an election issue in a way that would be simply impossible in Britain. In part two, we meet some of them to hear their reaction to the new milk quotas. Farmers, take your partner. Travel 40 miles northeast of Frankfurt and you find yourself in some of Germany's prettiest countryside. But the small villages and rolling hills of Hesse conceal some of the poorest farmland in northern Europe, which can grow grass but scarcely anything else. Like so many farmers in this area, Christian Rollwagen's holding is not concentrated into a single block, but is spread out over a wide area. He was cutting grass to zero graze his cows back home in the barn some three miles away. The Rollwagen's farm is called Eichhoff, and they moved here only three years ago. They've just completed a new barn and milking parlor for 80 cows, which was essential if they were to expand. It cost 150,000 pounds, and to repay this loan, he needs a big milk check every month. Christian and his wife have worked hard to increase their herd. He reckons that they could produce 360,000 liters a year, but it looks as if his quota will be for only 200,000. So did he think he could survive? Well, this question is really difficult to answer because there's a lot of uncertainty for us now. The quota system started on the 2nd of April. So far, we do not have any official message about what our quota will be. We've got a letter from the dairy saying that we will probably have a quota which is 1983 minus 11%. And this is very low because we have built a new stall in 1983 and we have increased the number of cows a lot. So we hope to be a special case. And we have written a letter to the Office of Agriculture that they will uh, answer to this demand. But we don't have any answer yet. And we do not know that if we are a special case, what quota we will get. Is there a great fuss about the special case? Who will be a special case? Who will not be a special case? Yeah, of course. Every, everybody feels to be a special case, but uh, they can't make everybody a special case because afterwards we'll have more milk than before. <laughs> but are you optimistic that you personally will be one? Yes, I think I'm... Well, there's different reasons why you can be a special case and what was in the paper. Being young, having built a new stall, living in an area that is a little bit underdeveloped perhaps as you might call it, and all these things happen here, so we are optimistic. 
But Christian is anything but a typical Hesse farmer. A herd of this size is almost unknown in this part of the country. For a better picture of farming in the region, I went to the local dairy. They collect from about 1,000 farmers over a radius of 30 miles, paying a generous 18.5 pence a litre, compared with the British producers, 12.5. I asked the general manager, Dr. Murke, to describe his typical producer. The typical farmer, the average, is about eight cows. This is a very small number, but that is, uh, that is a typical farmer in this area. And what would the smallest farmer be? Would there be one? The smallest, the smallest farmers are farmers with one or two cows. You actually collect milk from farmers yes. with one cow? Oh, yes. We do so, but uh, they uh, come to a central point in the village, and there we collect uh, the milk of these uh, small uh, farmers. Now, your average farmer with eight cows, would he be a full-time farmer or would he have another job in a factory? Um, he has another job. He has an outside job in a factory. Uh, let me say about uh, 15 cows. Um, that is a minimum for a full-time job, but better 25 or 30 cows in a family uh, dairy farm. I'd always been told that herds of four cows were normal in this part of Germany, but I'd never really believed it. These, of course, were owned by part-time farmers. But what about the full-time man? But now with the quota system, Christian took me to meet some of his neighbors, a father and son team who make a living out of 15 cows and nothing else. Over a bottle of beer, they told me how quotas were going to affect them. And not ausreichend for two arbeitskräfte. Well, if the quota stays as it is at the moment, and uh, if they are not a special case, which they hope, this will be the end of the farm. This will be the end of the farm. What will you do then? Was macht ihr dann? Ja, das ist mir ein neuer Job. Ich bin ja immer Meister machen, wieder bei der Schule oder total umschulen. My son is going to look for a new job, and he's trying to get a job in agriculture, and if not, he's had to have another training, and the father is going to retire. Whose fault does Mr. Decker think it is? Wessen Fehler ist es, dass es so kommt? Wenn mir was passiert wäre, die Familie wäre also... This family has lost a lot of lives during the war, and he was the only surviving, and he never had the courage to increase production a lot. But now, as there is two families living on the farm, they have to increase it, and with the quota system, they don't know any way out. It's a depressing story, but the German government's response has been a lot more generous than Mr. Jopling's. While I was there, they announced a complicated VAT rebate scheme worth about 5% on the price of milk. And a further 300 million pounds has been made available for a golden handshake to get out of milk. It was going to be run on a first-come, first-served basis. And I wondered if many of Christian's neighbors would be tempted by this. Yes, especially in this area. A lot of old people who are going to stop anyhow within a few years, they are stopping earlier now and take this money with them. Are you in any way attracted? No, not at all. Because if at the maximum I could get 15,000 marks uh, from the government in this program, and it wouldn't be enough to pay the interest for the building. What do you think about an English dairy farmer who, for example, will be milking 100, 200 cows? Do you think he is more efficient than you or less efficient? More efficient, of course, because he has got more cows and he's got a better climate. But wasn't the common market designed to make the efficient producer succeed and the inefficient fail? No, it shouldn't be, because if this happens, all this area around us will be desert. <laughs> it's, it's not a personal problem that we are not so efficient. It's a problem of the climate and of the soil. And we can't change that. <laughs> 
The plight of the small farmer in Germany is a very real political problem, and we in England would be foolish to laugh it off. Many Germans are convinced that the part-time farmer is both a sensible way to produce food and also contributes to the stability of the countryside. Nobody has promoted this philosophy more vigorously than the man who for 13 years was Minister of Agriculture and is now President of the DLG, Joseph Ertl. I think that it's the only way to have a stabilized society. And uh, the German part-time farmers know it and they recognize that there is, their main task is not to get the income on the farm way, that is a part of the income. The major part of the income comes from the other job. And I think that is a very stable way that this is why the Germans have less strikes like, like the British. Right. I can only give the British the I advice to make more part-time farmers in a solid social way. What do you say to the big German farmer who feels that you spend too much money and too much time on the small part-time farmer? I think that the German big farmer is not so thing. I never have heard, uh, and I'm very happy we have not too much big farmers. We have more medium and small farmers. I think that is for the social life and for the economic life and for a landscape with villages, for a better pollution, a very big advantage we have against other countries in the community. Mr. Speaker, I wish to ask the Secretary of State for the Environment if he will make a statement about the future of 92 acres of Halvergate Marshes, which is Grade 1 listed landscape in the ownership of Mr. David Wright. Resigning. Mr. Speaker, four of the five farmers who gave notice some months ago of their intention to plough parts of Halvergate Marshes now agreed not to proceed this year. The fifth, Mr. David Wright, declined to enter into a holding agreement. While I much regret that Mr. David Wright has decided to start drainage operations on his land, I do not consider that the Broads Authority's decision in this in which is the Secretary of State aware that having a stipulation that you actually pay farmers and landlords not to use land is an open invitation to blackmail the taxpayer. The machines draining David Wright's land on the Halvergate marshes last week were doing more than burying plastic pipes under the soil. As a heated parliamentary debate showed, they were also undermining one of the government's prized pieces of legislation the Wildlife and Countryside Act. The Act contained two fundamental points. The first was that conservation should be achieved by voluntary agreement and not by compulsion. The second was that if a farmer really did lose money by agreeing to conservation measures, he should be compensated for lost profits. Noble ideals, but as we shall see, they threatened to bring the whole Act into disrepute only three years after it went onto the statute book.
David Wright exposed the weakness of the act by using a herbicide. He did nothing illegal whatsoever. But for environmental pressure groups like the Friends of the Earth, it underlined their impotence in their battle to preserve the countryside. Since the war, this country has lost wildlife habitats to the order of 95% of our herb-rich hay meadows, about 50% of our ancient woodlands, and 80% uh, of the flower-rich and butterfly-rich chalk and limestone grasslands. They've gone entirely, and they cannot be recreated. So what we're talking about at the moment is trying to protect the remnants of wildlife habitats often very beautiful places as well, that um, still remain. And at the moment, the law just isn't good enough to do that. Back on Halvergate Marshes, the local farmers are genuinely puzzled by all the fuss. They've been draining the land for ages and are proud of the fact. Well, the marshes I'm working on, I only acquired them four years ago and started to plough them three years ago. And I'll, I don't plow, I rotivate and uh, subsoil, that's the only, and disc, that's the only way I do my marshes. We've drained our land and finished, finished doing so, all except the latest bit that we did last year, all over the last 20 years, really. We, we did it all before conservation became fashionable. This is eminently suitable for arable cropping. The Wildlife and Countryside Act didn't say that there will never, ever be any, any further change in the countryside. I, mean, I sincerely hope they never would, because it's a crazy way to spend public money and, and, and control the, uh, the countryside. Ridiculous. But half this last punch-up is to discredit the Wildlife and Countryside Act. These professional characters, they don't like the idea of, of, of a, free, uh, uh, a free agreement of people. They want compulsion. And the Wildlife and Countryside Act doesn't give them compulsion. That's why they're trying to roger it. The government had hoped that the act would bring farmers and conservationists together. But far from being an amnesty promoting peace, the act has provoked a punch-up. Meanwhile, the public becomes increasingly worried as they see huge sums of money being paid as compensation to farmers for doing nothing. The first indication of what was wrong with the act took place here at Halvergate. One of the local farmers, Roy Dunthorne, owned 110 acres, which had been designated a Site of Special Scientific Interest, or SSSI. He wanted to drain, plow, and grow arable crops on the land, but the Nature Conservancy disagreed. After long negotiations, Mr. Dunthorne was offered a management agreement by the NCC. He undertook to keep his land as grazing pasture. But in return, he received about 200 pounds per acre, index linked for the next 21 years as compensation for the profits he would have made if he'd planted wheat. An annual payment of more than 20,000 pounds. The act had always intended to compensate farmers in this manner. But it immediately became clear that if every farmer who owned an SSSI were to threaten to plough, the cost of compensation would be astronomic. If the total cost um, could be of the order of 40 million a year if there were a lot of agreements like this concluded. I and mean, that's the, the, the sort of ceiling we're talking about, 40 million a year, compared to the Nature Conservancy's estimate of maybe 20 million over 10 years. So there's an awful lot of taxpayers' money being locked up in these agreements, and uh, I think um, it must be at some stage opened up so that people can see what's being paid and to whom and why. And I think when it is opened up, um, people will see the Act as a very expensive way of, and rather a cumbersome and inefficient way of achieving what they want to achieve, conservation of the countryside. But the dramas on the Halvergate Marsh are not really typical of the relationship between farming and conservation. For a better example of how the Wildlife and Countryside Act works in practice, this SSSI on the Norfolk Suffolk border, consisting of swampy ground growing alders, is a case in point. Like most sites, it's not owned by a single man. In fact, the 4,000 SSSIs in the country share no less than 30,000 owners, which enormously complicates the job of the understaffed Nature Conservancy. Under the provisions of the Act, they are required to notify every owner formally with the details of the site and a list of practices which are not allowed. We're interested in trying to preserve this particular habitat 
Earlier this year, Peter Wright of the NCC visited one of the owners, Robin Bramley, to do just that. And I'm really here to talk to you about the implications of notifying the site under the new Wildlife and Countryside Act and to hear what your views are and your proposals for management. Um, one of the most important things, I think, is to understand that in this new procedure that we have now, um, you're going to, going to have to consult us before you carry out certain works, because in the old days, you didn't know much about our interest on your, on your land, and uh, we didn't really know very much about what you were doing uh, on, on these areas. But now it's been formalized, and uh, uh, the key word there is one is consultation rather than confrontation. Yes. So well, I'm actually quite pleased to hear that, because mm. whilst I've been aware by chance that this has been a site of special scientific interest for some years, mm. uh, I've often tried to find out exactly what you think is special about it to see whether it coincides with what I might think is special about it. Yeah. Well, shall we go down and have a look yes, a bit more closely looking. now? It has been a common complaint that many landowners never knew that they had an SSSI on their property. Indeed, some may still not know because the process of re-notification is so very slow. Well, this is the, the existing SSI, Robin, and uh, as you know better than I do, it's an area of... Uh, in the, the meanwhile, the future of this site seems likely to be agreed harmoniously. 50, 60 years, if not more. Very wet underfoot and quite interesting to see some Like of most landowners uh, notified since the act, Robin Bramley has asked for and will receive a management agreement. He will undertake to look after the site, refrain from damaging practices like draining, and will also try to improve it by gradual coppicing. But in return, he will receive a sum of money for his efforts. I don't anticipate that whatever grant I was to get for managing this in a way which was beneficial to the environment would pay more than half the cost of doing so. And I don't anticipate that managing this in a long term is going to be a profitable exercise. So, effectively, I shall be doing something, or my family will be doing something which is quite expensive, for which we shall have some help. We won't be having holidays in the south of France on the strength of the Nature Conservancy Council, which is a different matter, and which is an impression which is often given when grants and proven loss payments and so on are made. The problem has been that because the Wildlife and Countryside Act has re reasonably, relatively recently come into, uh, uh, into being is that uh, we're picking up a number of uh, difficult uh, cases elsewhere, and these are, these are obviously receiving the attention. But by and large, my experience would be that um, the sites are rather like this one, and um, the owners are basically sympathetic and interested, and uh, we've got to communicate better than we have done in the past, and I, I would certainly take mm. Mr. Bramley's point about this. I think it, in this case, it is simplified by the fact that there isn't a wildly lucrative alternative staring us in the face. Uh, if there was, of course, there'd be more pressure on us to pursue it and uh, more pressure on the Nature Conservancy to prevent it. And indeed, where there is a profitable alternative land use to conservation, the Act has run into big trouble. In part two, we look at two of the most contentious cases, both in Scotland. Compared to some Scottish lairds, Lord Thurzo has an almost modest estate of some 60,000 acres. Included in that is a 5,000 acre peat bog known by its Gaelic name of Bla Namfoliag, or the wasteland of the seagulls. Although the bog had been designated an SSSI in 1973, Lord Thurzo decided four years ago that it should be developed. My principal plan would have been to win the peat off the surface. Uh, I wasn't so interested in, in actually uh, making money out of selling the peat, but I was very interested in getting down to the land that lies underneath it, because had one been able to find an economic way of working the peat and getting it off the surface, then you could have got down to the same kind of land as makes the arable land of the rest of Caithness. But unfortunately, it was the, the Nature Conser Conservancy's SSSI which stood in the way of the whole thing. When we got to the talking point, um, they said, oh, but there are 
uh, difficulties and um, we, we can't get the planning permission. Commercial peat extraction is already being done on several sites in northern Scotland, but like sand and gravel workings, it requires planning permission from the local authority. The Nature Conservancy became aware of Lord Thurzo's intentions and indicated that, because it was an SSSI, they would certainly object. The application could then have been turned down without any compensation at all. But tree planting, unlike peat extraction, does not require planning permission and, under the terms of the Act, is eligible for compensation. It was in order to try and prove how serious this restriction was that I came up with the forestry idea. I didn't really want to plant trees all over this ground. I wanted to prove whether the Nature Conservancy would put their money where their mouth was. And I wanted to know that I could, in fact, deal with people over taking all this peat off and turning it into arable ground. So uh, when I came forward with a forestry proposition, which was everybody knew was viable immediately, the Nature Conservancy had to take, take me seriously. And at that point, uh, they came round and begged me, literally begged me, not to go ahead with anything. And they said that to do anything, to put so much as a drain, to clean the existing drains, would ruin this marvellous quaking bog, which was the fifth best bog in Europe and uh, one of the biggest bogs of its kind in Britain. So uh, I eventually succumbed to pressure and uh, I said, well, all right, if you can find enough money to pay me out for what I had in mind, um, you know, I'll, I'll agree to let you, let you have it as a nature reserve. So there it is. Many of the locals found it hard to believe that much of this very wet area could actually grow trees. But the Nature Conservancy conceded the point. To them, the site was much too important to lose. Well, this bog is one of the few remaining examples of an actively growing peat bog in the north of Scotland, and it is one of the best preserved of those sites. So what makes a peat bog growing, meaning that it's still actively accumulating peat, the peat is still building up on this site, are plants like these, the bog mosses, the sphagnum species, which form great tussocks of vegetation which do not rot down. And if I take some of this up, you can see that the remains of the plant going back for years and they don't decay at all. The plants hold water like a sponge and so keep these sites very, very wet. There are certainly bits within this site which are on today's standards acceptable for forestry. Further out towards the middle of the site, uh, no, it wouldn't ever have been suitable for forestry. Having agreed not to develop the bog, there was then the question of compensation. Many conservationists were worried that any payment would set a dangerous precedent. They feared that the owners of other Scottish wide open spaces would all start threatening to plant trees too. I think if you're going to decide to conserve something uh, in perpetuity, you've got to compensate people for it. Um, it's the only thing you can do. You can't, uh, otherwise, you, you just simply give the Nature Conservancy the right to come in and uh, pinch things from people. There obviously has been a lot of controversy about the amount of money. Do you think it was fair compensation? No, I don't. I mean, theoretically, uh, it was worth millions to me. And in practice, it wasn't anything like that that I got. I'm not going to tell you how much I did get either, because I never ever have told anybody. <laughs> in fact, the Nature Conservancy have published the figure. It was a lump sum of £278,000 for a 99-year lease renewable with no further payment. In return, the land was secured as a national nature reserve. Meanwhile, the two sides remain poles apart when it comes to assessing its conservation value. I'd far rather see it be reclaimed. It's a terrible waste of money and effort and land and everything to, to leave it undeveloped. Conservation creates no jobs at all, safeguards no, nobody's livelihood. I think at the moment we are conservation mad. We're conserving far too many things, and I think there will come a time when an awful lot of these so-called sites of special interest will be ploughed up or planted or turned into something else. It will be found necessary to do it. Um, the problem is in years to come whether people will look back and say, did we do enough? And it's very likely they may think not.
Deep in the heart of the highlands, another dispute between forestry and conservation threatens the credibility of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. At issue are 10,000 acres on the slopes of Craig Meggy, overlooking Loch Lagan. Well, you've got a whole complex here of upland interests. Uh, first of all, starting at the top, you've got montane vegetation, Rackhamitrum heath, snow patch vegetation. And then, as you go over the back of the mountain here, you've got incredible cliff faces with uh, cliff ledge vegetation, very rich cliff le ledge vegetation, uh, a lot of interesting species in it. And then, as you come down the slope, you've got very characteristic uh, moorland and upland communities. And then over and above the plant interest, you've also got uh, golden eagles here, peregrine falcon, and uh, a whole community of upland bird species. In 1982, 10 years after it had been designated an SSSI, Craig Meggy was bought by Fountain Forestry. In order to obtain a grant worth about 100 pounds an acre, they submitted plans to the Forestry Commission for planting 1,500 acres. Oh, well, we objected. Uh, the Forestry Commission sent us a copy of the plans. We had a look at it, and we realized that a whole section of the site with these plant communities was going to be destroyed by their plans, so we objected. Although they'd always known it was an SSSI, the news was not well received by Fountain Forestry. Well, I'm very disappointed. I think here we, we s set out to accommodate all good conservation principles. And I, I thought this was a good example where the, the Wildlife and Countryside Act was working in, in the way it was thought to work by uh, compromise and negotiation and not really getting to the cash business, which is the sort of irritant, I think, with, uh, uh, with the public, that we thought we were doing all this on the back of our forestry scheme. The Forestry Commission approved the scheme and, by implication, agreed that the planting of 1,500 acres would not harm the SSSI. The dispute is now in the hands of the Secretary of State for Scotland, who is arbitrating between foresters and conservationists. But whatever the result, the taxpayer will be the loser. If, as seems likely, fountain forestry are not allowed to plant trees, they will be entitled to cash for profits foregone. The alternative is for the site to be bought by the Nature Conservancy itself. Neither solutions are likely to cost less than the original purchase price of £300,000. But Mike Ashmole insists that he too will lose out. We have lost out. I mean, we paid for this 18 months ago. Um, we've been involved uh, for 18 months in discussions, in writing reports, in fact, employing cons specialist consultants in order to make our proposals more, or what we thought more acceptable to the NCC, and then the funding of, of, uh, of a place like this. So it's, it's been a, a financial disaster for us uh, to date. But under the Wildlife and Countryside Act, presumably then you are compensated in full, aren't you? Well, it's working out the full bit uh, that's a problem. I mean, I, I really couldn't see how we could be compensated in full unless the NCC came along and took the place off as a sort of price we've boarded at, plus any uh, costs we've incurred. I mean, that would be the only way they could compensate us in full. What does this mean for the Wildlife and Countryside Act? Well, if a site like this can't be protected by it, it means that the strength of the Act elsewhere must be severely undermined. The amount of money needed to preserve Craig Meggy and Lord Thurso's bog have shown that the Wildlife and Countryside Act can be an open-ended commitment. Critics also point out that the compensation includes not just profits foregone, but subsidies and grants foregone too. That means forestry tax concessions on Craig Meggy and drainage grants on Halvergate Marsh. It's not surprising that the pressure for change is building up fast. I think there's got to be some kind of stop on the development of SSIs. Um, there must be no presumption to pay management agreements at anything like this sort of level. Perhaps a once-for-all payment um, to reflect a loss of capital value of the land, and from then on a stop on all production. In other words, planning control on SSIs. What we don't think is fair is the present system where money is automatically available, where the public subsidies that would have been available for damaging operations are then paid out for compensation. And that finally, that no matter how wealthy the landowner is, I mean, he could be Paul Getty, 
and he would still receive the compensation under the present system. Now, that must be wrong. And, and the element of risk, which is, seems to me an integral part of farming, is gone. Um, he's guaranteed. His, his hypothetical crop is put into the ground and um, managed properly and harvested and sold at a good price. And his tractors haven't left the shed. Pay compensation if the farmer genuinely needs it. If he honestly is going to make a difference to his standard of living to protect this site for the nation, then pay him compensation on a lump sum basis. But most importantly, as, as far as protecting these special sites are concerned, they should be guaranteed safety, just like we protect Tudor cottages or, or, or any other of the cultural equivalents of these irreplaceable sites. There's no doubt that the conservation lobby has got both farmers and the Ministry of Agriculture on the run. They may well get their way on SSSIs, but what about the 94% of this country not covered by SSSIs? Next week, we talk to farmers, land agents and politicians, all of whom agree that the law must be changed. The only argument is how. Fifteen years ago, most of the North Kent coast looked like this. But since then, nearly half the marshes have been drained and now grow fields of wheat and oilseed rape. The crops they produce are some of the best in England. One of the few remaining areas of undrained marsh is Kings Hill Farm, a 2,000-acre chunk of the Isle of Sheppey. It, too, would have gone under the plough but for a remarkable agreement between the local farmer and the Nature Conservancy Council. The NCC describe it as a model of how the Wildlife and Countryside Act was meant to work. But critics come to a very different conclusion. They reckon that the farmer will be paid up to one million pounds over the next 10 years and say that deals like this will destroy the Act. Kings Hill Farm is owned by the Oxford University Chest. In 1975, they gave the tenancy to Philip Merricks on the express understanding that he should drain the marshes and convert the old grazing land which paid a low rent into valuable wheat land which paid a high rent. The local drainage board got to work and put in the main channels to lower the water table. Everything was going smoothly. But in 1979, life suddenly became a lot more complicated. The Nature Conservancy stepped into the scene and reminded Mr. Merricks that these marshes were a site of special scientific interest and that any drainage would damage the site very seriously. Well, I felt very upset because, of course, they'd altered their mind from 1975 to 1979. But, of course, the whole climate was changing. Conservation movement was growing every year, and of course I was totally unaware of it. Just getting on with farming, one didn't realise the the pressures there were behind the scenes. The potential profit to be made from this land is very great indeed. Four tons of wheat per acre is not unreasonable. So, with 2,000 acres of land to farm, an income of three quarters of a million pounds a year is perfectly possible. But I was surprised to learn that it was not the ancient grassland I'd imagined. These marshes, you see, they, they were ploughed in the war. They were ploughed in Victorian times uh, for, for cereal production. Are you saying that 30, 40 years ago, the field we're standing on was growing wheat? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, these, these marshes were ploughed during the war. They were was ploughed as long ago as Victorian times. We so these are not virgin territory marshes in which nothing's happened except a few ducks? Oh, gosh, no, 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 no. They, I think it's obviously... That, um, it, they've had a history of stock grazing and they've had a history of uh, arable.
vegetable production. And we've had, obviously, they reverted back to grass after the war. And um, we felt in 1975 it was time to plow them up, along with an awful lot of other farmers all through the country. Instead, Philip Merricks decided to cooperate with the Nature Conservancy and negotiate for a management agreement. But it didn't take the critics long to figure out that even the most modest compensation of 50 pounds per acre would amount to an annual payment of 100,000 pounds. This, they claimed, would be paid to a farmer for doing nothing. It's a conclusion which, of course, Merricks rejects. The whole point, of course, that we're not doing nothing since 1982, a couple of years ago, we agreed that if we weren't allowed to drink, we might as well try and do something positively towards it. So, in fact, it's going to be turned into a national nature reserve, and it will be, in fact, the biggest one in southern England. So the whole point about this, it's not doing nothing, it's managing the land positively for conservation and creating a nature reserve. I mean, we've got two wardens up here at the moment. One's doing a feasibility study of, of, of what should be done. But the whole point of it is, if you're going to create this nature reserve, it has to be positively managed. It's not leaving things as they are. It's putting up earthworks and, and flooding areas and putting up hides and car parks and public access and interpretation centers. Because my whole point is there are three ways of looking at it. Either the marshes can be improved by draining and plowing, or they can be left as they are, or they can be improved for conservation. And I think doing nothing, the middle course, is just negative from everybody's point of view. And we decided this two and a half years ago. Philip Merrick's evident enthusiasm for the conversion of his farm into a national nature reserve disarms almost all of his critics. When the old farm buildings are eventually converted into a visitor centre, the place will become a showpiece of how farming and conservation can coexist happily. Owners of SSSIs like Kings Hill Farm are not free to do with the land what they want. If the worst comes to the worst and no agreement is reached, the Nature Conservancy can always step in and compulsorily purchase the land. But on the 94% of Great Britain which is not covered by SSSIs, the Act's powers are very limited indeed. The best example of the problem can be seen in the national parks, like the North York Moors. These spectacular heather hills stretch over hundreds of square miles of northeast Yorkshire and provide a popular outdoor space for the surrounding industrial cities. But the park authorities are fighting a losing battle to try and keep the landscape as it is today. Well, the main problem is trying to retain the heather moorland, which is the characteristic landscape feature of the North York Moors. Over the past few years, quite a lot has disappeared, as you can see, for agricultural purposes, some for forestry as well. The park committee is determined to keep the, the area of moorland that remains as being the main feature of the national park. That determination should have been reinforced by the Act, but the park authorities don't see it that way. No, we don't. Uh, we think uh, it's moving in the right direction, certainly. Uh, the consultation scheme under the Wildlife Act was a big step forward. But what we would like to see is some sort of compulsory power, long-stop power, which we can use in cases where uh, a site of particular value is under threat, coupled with an agricultural support system which encourages conservation rather than being solely concentrated on food production, which is the case at the moment. Under the Act, the landowners must notify the park authority of their intention to plough any land which has been untouched during the past 20 years. The two sides then have a year in which to thrash out a management agreement. But if they fail, the farmer can go ahead and plough without any penalty at all. So far, Derek Statham hasn't managed to conclude a single agreement. I don't think the farmer in this part of the world likes to have uh, uh, interference with his everyday farming operations. He likes to retain the freedom to make his own choice, farming his own land. I think that is the main reason. One of the problems stems from the fact that upland farmers, especially those keeping sheep, make quite a bit of money these days. Another is that you can increase the value of land easily with only a small capital outlay. The likeliest recruit so far to a management agreement is the owner of this 50 acres of rough moorland. Reeves Hebron wanted to convert it to grassland to get his son started off in dairying. He approached the park authorities for a grant to fence it off. Their answer was to offer him a management agreement if he would promise to leave the land alone. 
my immediate reaction was to, to blow it instantly. And then, you know, they said, would I listen? And I said, well, yes, I would be a fool not to listen. But I said, uh, at the end of the day, it would have to be very good to, to not blow it, as it was so workable and, 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 and it was just right for what we wanted. Reeve Hebron's neighbours thought he'd gone soft. Even his son was very reluctant to get involved. Oh, very reluctant. I've, I've had a, an awful job with him. He, well, at 18 and, uh, and wanting to work, he just, just wanted to be on and doing something. And, uh, you know, I couldn't realise that somebody that would pay him for, for not doing it. That's... <laughs> which was my opinion at the time. It seems silly, but that's uh, probably something we're going to have, to have to accept. The amount of cash on offer is roughly 50 pounds per acre. Derek Statham hopes that if Reeves Hebron can be persuaded to accept a management agreement, other farmers might be encouraged to follow suit. But even so, he doesn't think that this sort of voluntary agreement is the solution to protecting the landscape that it's terribly bureaucratic and cumbersome to negotiate and so tentative and one doesn't really know what the sanctions would be against a farmer who didn't, uh, didn't comply with the agreement in any case because we haven't had an instance yet. The whole system I is so cumbersome that I feel o over a period of time people will find that it just isn't working. The other part of the agreement which sticks in his throat is the compensation. I don't like compensation. I think we want to have a system whereby compensation is only used in very rare cases, such as it is under the planning system at the moment. I don't see why one shouldn't have an agricultural support system whereby there should be no question of a farmer getting a grant and getting a financial incentive if he's going to do something which is detrimental to conservation. The Wildlife and Countryside Act does at least give the national parks a framework, however flimsy, in which to operate. But areas like the Halvergate Marshes have no such legal backing. The only arrangement between the farming community and local government, the Broads Authority, is a voluntary scheme. The farmers are meant to notify the authority of their intention to plough. The Broads Authority can then enter into management agreements with farmers, but the cost, at up to £200 per acre per year on perhaps 15,000 acres, even with a government grant, is far more than they can possibly afford. But does the Wildlife and Countryside Act help them in their search for a solution to today's confrontation? No, I don't think wetlands were taken into consideration. I think the 10 national parks were thought about because they have upland environments. Their farming is marginal. It's not very good. You find, therefore, that the amount of money to safeguard a small acreage of landscape is um, really very small but the expensive wetland area with potentially tremendously productive land simply was not thought about. Meanwhile, if the farmers who are prepared to talk in public are in any way typical, the chances of concluding an agreement are pretty slim. It's all wrong to offer compensation. But there's something for nothing. We don't want anything for nothing down on our marshes. We want to do what we've always been doing and uh, well, keep plowing. Th this is the point the conservationists are making, surely. You're doing something you haven't always been doing. Well, I've been plowing marshes for over 30 years. Well, they're so probably not growing wheat, though, are they? They were growing wheat. They've yeah. all grown wheat. And they've been now let go back to grass. But, but this is a ridiculous place to be fighting this battle, isn't it? You, uh, you got down here, two miles down, down a rough old road. When the conservationists arri arrived after a good morning in the pub, they're usually taken down here by the television uh, Range Rovers. It's miles from anywhere. The public won't see this. They don't even see it as they go past in, in the railway uh, half a mile away. What on earth is the point of fighting over this now? It's planning permission. It's men in flat hats. There were, there were 100 graduates of the School of Environmental Science in Norwich this year. These are the boys that want jobs. These are the boys that want more power. And the, and the professional environmentalists who are running all these pressure groups. These are the boys who long for planning permission. Marvellous. Make them important. They, they do a tremendous job. But planning permission isn't a, isn't, isn't a sensible thing at all. Sensible thing is for people to cooperate. Farmers know what the heck is a reasonable way of carrying on, and, they, and they'll carry on in a reasonable way, and, and, and they're more alert to it than they were. 
But if you have a man in a flat hat say you can't do this, there's nothing to stop me coming down here at five o'clock in the morning and spraying round up over every damn thing. Then what'll you do? That's not cooperation, really, now, is it? Of course it? it isn't cooperation, but it's a means of defeating the man in the flat hat. We're down here, we can be down here 24 hours a day. The man in the flat hat will be strictly on office hours. How is he going to do it? It's a recipe for nothing but trouble. I think if they hadn't have been so much trouble over the last year or two, there wouldn't be so much land flowed. I certainly wouldn't have done my last 25 acres, but I was much afraid that there was going to be laws come in that we can't do that, and then the land is worth much less money. What do you mean when you say the trouble in the last two years? What, well, what are you the trouble with these um, people that come down here interfering with, which has got nothing to do with them. You, you, so you thought that unless you plant up your land quickly, yes. somebody might actually pass a law to stop you? Yes. You think a lot of farmers around here I, have that attitude? I think, I think it has hastened the pain, pace of change, yes. I'm quite, quite sure of it. And these gentlemen who are, who are getting compensation at the moment, I, I have a sneaking feeling that that won't last for very long and they're getting compensation while the boys are moving behind the scenes to, uh, to stop them by statutory me methods. So, if anything, the Wildlife and Countryside Act has hindered rather than helped conservation in the national parks and at Halvergate. In part two, how it's affected as if... Each spring, this small field in Suffolk bursts into bloom, and for a few weeks, it's a spectacular display of an increasingly rare plant, the snake's head fritillary. Not surprisingly, it's an SSSI, and its future is not in danger, because it's owned by the Suffolk Naturalist Trust. But it's been pointed out that if the trust wanted to increase its meager resources, what they should do is to threaten to plough up their own nature reserve. The trust could then conclude a management agreement with the NCC and receive compensation for not growing wheat. It won't happen, of course, in this case. But some people claim that farmers up and down the country are making just this sort of calculation. To find out what would be involved, I invited a local land agent to my farm, where we ourselves have an eight-acre SSSI. For a few weeks during the summer, it grows lovely marsh orchids, and this is what excites the conservationist. It's a wet part of the farm, and we haven't even considered draining it. But supposing we told the Nature Conservancy that we wanted to grow wheat instead of marsh orchids, what sort of management agreement would they be obliged to offer us? There are two sorts of management agreements you can have. One is for a capital sum of money, uh, and the other is on an annual income loss basis. Now, if I can just deal with the annual income loss first, it would cost about £500 an acre to drain this field, mm. and you would get a 30% grant. So that's about £350 an acre to drain it. Now, the next question I would ask you is, how much extra money can you make on your farm by cropping these pieces of land and growing similar crops to the next door field? All I'd need is the variable cost of a field of wheat, which I reckon is about 100 quid an acre. That's all it would cost me. And I like to think I'd get at least three tonne an acre, maybe three and a half tonne of wheat out of it. So the answer to your question is it would cost me 100 quid and I'd get about 350 quid out of it. So what you're saying is that you'd make an extra profit by draining this land of about 250 pounds an acre. Yes. Which on this land is, is um, a very substantial total figure, about mm. 2,000 pounds a year mm. for this piece of land. Now, what you've got to deduct from that is the amortized cost of actually draining it, because mm. you, you've had an expenditure of £350 right. pounds an acre. And what the Nature Conservancy will do, and we would do in agreement with them, is we'd work out a figure to represent the interest on that capital and the write-off of that drainage over a period of, say, 15 or 20 years. So that might work out at a, a figure of something like another £35 pounds an acre off the figure of 250, which you're suggesting. So are you saying to me that you could probably, repeat probably, get for me 220 quid odd a year from the Nature Conservancy for leaving this field as it is? Given that the facts that you, 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 you yeah. told me are right, yes, that, that, that is what they seek to do. What they seek to do is to put you in no worse a position than had you been allowed to do what you wanted to do. Do you think a lot of people are making the same calculation right now? I think a lot of people must be making the same calculation, yes. 
I think that the law will, will have to be changed because I, I don't think that the, the taxpayer is going to stand going on, on, on paying out this money to people not to do what a lot of them weren't going to do in the first place. Now, some people have suggested that one of the problems of the, of the new Act, Wildlife and Countryside Act, is that it has induced some farmers to go for management agreements even though they have no intention of ploughing anything up. Do you reckon that's true in this area? Yes, I do. There's marshes that are completely inaccessible by road down here, and uh, the marshes are well over to our left, yeah. and no way can you get to the marshes. You can't get down here when there's, when there's really bad weather. So they couldn't, if they ploughed the marshes, they couldn't perhaps get the crops off. So they're really going for the management agreement to get the money? Oh, I think so, yes. There is now, if you like, a market price for conservation. A lot of farmers want to get in on that. So in some ways, paradoxically, although the Act may have preserved Halvergate here, um, in other places it may have actually pushed sites towards uh, damage or destruction. Well, I think that people should consider, if there are any, and uh, I, I don't think there are many, but there will probably be some who are, who are thinking of this in a frivolous way, what can we get out of government? Well, I would say to them, that's a rather childish approach. But if you do that, then gov some government, whether it's this one or some subsequent government, will take a view that people haven't behaved responsibly and that money can't be made available in every case. Now, I'm not saying this government's going to take that view, but if people try to exploit an act which depends on a sensible, voluntary approach, they try to exploit it, well, then that act won't work. The conservation lobby wants SSSIs to be subject to planning permission, and they feel that if any compensation is paid, it should be in a single lump, rather than instalments for life as at present. The government might well agree to these changes once they're convinced that the Act is really being abused with bogus threats. But as well as tightening up the law governing SSSIs, the Department of the Environment is fighting a battle to change the attitude of the Ministry of Agriculture about conservation. At the moment, if we look at the Ministry of Agriculture policies, they are designed almost entirely to fuel agricultural development and expansion, particularly on marginal landscapes, these, which are usually very You're important. You're talking for about subsidies for drainage for putting up buildings for intensification, are you? Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, and unless that is changed, we're just going to have this juggernaut of agricultural expansion continuing, whether it is producing food we need or not. In the future, the only way to resolve the uh, conflicting priorities between conservation and modern agriculture, apart from the things I've already mentioned, the compensation, the planning controls, is to have agricultural support for farmers available for traditional farming techniques that are more sympathetic to the environment and conservation. And at the moment, the Ministry of Agriculture is behaving like a dinosaur. They don't think it's relevant, and they're living in the past. And it's a great, great shame. There is something inherently absurd about uh, the public subsidizing people in, out of one pocket to do things that we then have to bribe them not to do out of the other. Out of the other. Um, and uh, in this whole compensation business, lies a, a reasonable estimate of, of, of what is profitable, what society will allow to be profitable in terms of, of farming. On Halvergate marshes, the officials are now hinting strongly that a deal is being worked out which will direct Ministry of Agriculture funds into livestock farming. Well, despite all the controversy which has surrounded this case, it's become the national focus for the Wildlife and Countryside Act as a test. I believe we're going to get a fairly innovative and positive um, remedy from the government. I'm hopeful that at the next... Viewers are told that without the Eastern Bloc stars, the Los Angeles Olympics are bound to be a flop. After two days of talks on the future of Hong Kong, both Britain and China have been making optimistic noises this morning. The British negotiating team in B Peking, headed by Sir Geoffrey Howe, said contacts so far have been friendly and constructive, though the details are being kept secret. He'll see the Chinese Prime Minister tomorrow. The President of the European Parliament has said that Friday's vote to freeze Britain's refund wasn't an anti-British move. Pierre Flumelin said Europe MPs were showing their concern over the EEC's financial crisis. There was no doubt Britain would get the money back eventually. And while the Los Angeles athletes go for gold, another serious challenge on a world record is being made in London. 28-year-old Paul Lynch is aiming to break the world press-ups record. 
With just 30 second breaks, he has to beat 10,029. Paul's already a dab hand at the sport, holding the records for one arm and fingertip press-ups. Today's attempt is for his personal achievement Check. and to raise money for famine and relief in Africa. Paul began his attempt on the world record two hours ago, and at this rate, he'll be pressing on into the evening. And we'll show you how he's getting on in our next news at 6 o'clock. I'll leave you with a look at the weather. Well, it'll be another very hot day over England and Wales with temperatures up to 29 centigrade, 84 Fahrenheit, but uh, near some southern and western coasts it'll be cooler and cloudier. Southern Scotland and Northern Ireland will have some sunshine, but a few showers are also likely. Central and uh, northern Scotland will stay cloudy and cool with some rain at times. Sunday grandstand on...